Fletcher Henderson. As long ago as 1926, it was noted in a review in Variety that his jazzopation, as they put it, had been suitably adulterated for the white man's consumption. His career, I think, gives a perfect insight into the nature of the pressure put on jazz by commercial interests. But don't get me wrong, there are still very many records by Fletcher Henderson that I just wouldn't be without. Just Blues, Fletcher Henderson's Connie's Inn Orchestra in April 1931, and featuring solos by some of the excellent jazz men then working with him, Bobby Stark and Rick Stewart trumpets, Claude Jones and Benny Morton trombones, and Coleman Hawkins tenor. Fletcher Henderson most certainly had the knack of hiring good men. Back in 1923, he hired Don Redman, just a month or so after he'd first arrived in New York. They appeared together with Elmer Chambers' cornet in Henderson's first instrumental recordings for Columbia, a studio pickup group of uncertain composition known as Henderson's Hot Six. <laughs> Thank you. 
Gulf Coast Blues. My copy's a little battered, I'm afraid, but uh, it's certainly an interesting record. I think it gives a very good indication of the split in the Henderson persona. On the one hand was jazz, trying desperately to get out, while on the other was the pressure of earning a living. When he signed his first major contract with the Roseland Ballroom in 1924, he had to cater for a white audience that was used to bands like Sam Lannan's and Vincent Lopez's. Through his arrangers, principally Don Redman, he most certainly catered for their taste, but with one additional brilliant ingredient. Soloists of the calibre of Joe Smith, Charlie Green, and for one glorious year at least, Louis Armstrong. King Oliver's Sugarfoot Stomp, starring Louis Armstrong with Fletcher Henderson's orchestra in one of the first electrical recordings by Columbia, made in May 1925. The Henderson connection with the blues went back to his first regular jobs, first as a song plugger for W.C. Handy, then as musical director of Black Swan Records. In 1923, he made his first recordings with Bessie Smith for Columbia an association of mutual benefit resulting in some of her finest recordings and allowing Henderson and his men some uncompromising essays into the world of pure jazz. <laughs> Not a soul 
Cake Walking Babies, Bessie Smith, accompanied by Henderson's Hot Six, which included Joe Smith, Charlie Green and Buster Bailey, all regular members of the big band in May 1925. And big band it was becoming. When Louis Armstrong left the following November, it was ten in number. By the time 19-year-old Rex Stewart had plucked up courage to join as Louis's replacement, it had increased to eleven. That was in spring 1926. <laughs> Thank you. 
A Stampede, arranged by Don Redman and featuring solo trumpet by both Joe Smith and Rick Stewart and tenor by Coleman Hawkins, well back off the mic. When Rick Stewart returned to the band again in 1929, the number was up to 12. And Don Redman, who'd gone off back to Chicago to direct McKinney's Cotton Pickers, had been replaced as principal arranger by Benny Carter. Wang Wang Blues, a Benny Carter arrangement from 1929, featuring Bobby Stark and Rick Stewart trumpets, Jimmy Harrison trombone, Coleman Hawkins tenor, on mic that time, and that beautifully round-sounding brass bass thought to be played by Del Thomas, beautifully recorded. The following year, Fletcher Henderson caused a sensation by forsaking downtown Roseland's ballroom for an uptown Harlem club. It had been started by the Brothers Immerman, a couple of bootlegging grocers who entertained their uptown white clients with the best and hottest black bands. They named the place after one of the brothers, Connie's Inn. Thank you. 
Fletcher Henderson's Connie's Inn Orchestra in April 1931 with Singing the Blues, most probably updated by Bill Chalice himself from his original arrangement for Trombar in 1927. And Rick Stewart performed that deliberate copy of the original solo, a tribute to Bix Beiderbeck. With the departure of Benny Carter to join Chick Webb, Henderson began to concentrate much more on doing his own arranging, which was to stand him in good stead during the coming swing era. But he never really clicked as a band leader during the mid-30s. Maybe he reached his peak just a little too early and couldn't keep up the momentum. It seems to me that right at the top of that peak was the Connie's Inn Orchestra. House of David Blues, Fletcher Henderson's Connie's Inn Orchestra with solo violin by Edgar Sampson. The next program features a singer who was closely associated with Fletcher Henderson in New York, the Empress of the Blues, Bessie Smith. 